That will get me in there eventually. <laughs> I, I, I tried to use a tab and with a mouse and I tabbed the scenes on my uh, OBS incorrectly. So, well, it's, that's, that happens. Tapping and tapping and tapping. Ah, oh, there's too much going on. <laughs> that's funny. How are you doing, Bruce? Pretty good. Pretty good. Just, uh, you know, a uh, hot day in Southern California. That's really chilly here. I went for a run this morning and I'm in Milwaukee and uh, I don't think we'll hit 70 today. So, really? No. It's we're, we're, we're pushing mid 90s and there's like, uh, I think I saw 50% humidity, which of course, that's not any of the variable that you guys get there, but hot enough. That's enough. I think we'll probably get in the set. It is very, very humid here. You're right. It is not a lot of fun. It's very soupy. <laughs> it's not fun at all. So how you doing? We've got some people in the house. Um, cool. It's on a Saturday. It's Saturday morning. We usually do Sundays. Uh, I, know, I know. Well, I did that because I have a family obligation tomorrow. Uh, there's some, some kind of like a uh, family picnic thing. And, uh, you know, the rearrangement of the schedule had to go quickly, but uh, here we are, Saturday morning, 10 o'clock in the morning here in Los Angeles. I'm just getting started. My eyes are still kind of foggy. So, yeah, in real life, stuff does happen. And so we got some people actually uh, jumping in here, and hopefully, the, uh, the, the wrong time on the YouTube didn't throw people. I will make sure not to do that again. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we've got like Frank, Gardner, Bobby, Vihar, Tim uh andreas we got some people in here so that's great and i i'll be here to help you guys facilitate the questions so feel free to drop those questions and we'll get those on to bruce we're here for you yeah and um yeah so I, have a question. I have a question from some guy who sent me an email he said can i ask a question beforehand so let me just quickly sure pull that up uh Woo, that's a fun question. Let's see. Let me work it. Went left hand. So I guess at the end here, it says, just wondering uh, for left hand issues. Uh, his thumb is slipping off the stick, never played traditional grip, so that doesn't seem to be a good alternative. Uh, I know this is not an easy question to answer, but I'm wondering where I should go. So I guess he's really wondering about his left hand. It's not working. And he was saying that, uh, should he just forget about technique and just play grooves and work on grooves? I'm, I'm of the belief that you can work on strategies to increase range of motion, blood flow, and get things to work a little bit better than where they might currently stand. So what does that mean? You know, I'd have to get involved and kind of set in motion some of the exercises that I use. I've had guys who have focal dystonia. I uh, think, as, as I know it, three students that I recall. Uh, one, a very hardworking drummer with a band that's on the road all the time. And uh, we managed to work out some strategies where it got better. Now, I haven't seen him in maybe a year, oh, probably two years now. But uh, he would send me a little progress report and say that some of the things that we worked on helped him out. I'm not a miracle cure guy, so I can't fix everything, you know, and put it on the perfect uh, track. But there are strategies of, of working the hand and opening things up. I think there's other alternatives that you can do. There are supplements, turmeric, uh, other supplements for joint health and all that kind of stuff. You know, I don't know what the science is on all those, so I'm a little, I'm not skeptical, but... I think the dietary considerations can help open up channels inside your hand, but also the physical nature and the physical properties of what you do uh, and stretching and getting some of the pressure point exercises that I do and understanding the value of letting go and not, you know, clubbing the drum when you're hitting the drum so quickly or I mean, so uh, uh, ferociously, you're basically taking all that shock to your arm and you potentially are debilitating yourself. So the, the, the whole point is to try to strike a balance of what you do. Um, I'm a longtime practitioner of yoga. I firmly believe wholly in the regular practice of that. In fact, if I didn't do that, I think my head would be blowing up. I have two small children, five and eight year old. I have a, a puppy. I have a million students. So I actually went in and had a uh, doctor's appointment, a physical finally after not doing one last year. And was surprised my blood pressure is like really good for my age, you know, it was like 120 over 74 or something like that. And uh, I honestly bring it to, you know, my dietary considerations, 
regular yoga practice and meditation and getting a chance to work on my drums and also enjoying what I do. That's uh, part of the whole equation. So with that being said, I hope that gives you some, you know, potential. Uh, here's a question from Cassie Lobo. Hi, Bruce and Jeff. And greetings from India. Hey, man, greetings. Can you please share some tips on the three radical cues? Excellent question. Let's go there. So the Radomy cue. Now you say three Radomy cues. I know that there's a single, a double, and a triple. And so those are the three Radomy cues. But inside the single Radomy cue, let's talk about that one first. You have two different accent placements. You can have the accent on the down. That would be basically... As Jimmy Chapin pointed out to me many, many years ago, he said, Bruce, the uh, Radomir cue is nothing more than a double paradiddle. And I said, really? And when I thought about that, so the diddle of the double paradiddle becomes the drag of the Radomir cue. And so the motion would be the same. I would have down, up, down, up, down, up down, up. And so if I was going to get the accent on the downstroke, it would be still lifting up on the end. If I'm thinking in 60 note triplets, I'm thinking one E and two E and. And then the second version would be getting the accent on the end. That would be an upstroke accent. So I want to make a soft landing on the down. And that's basically it. I mean, when you get the double uh, random Q, if I'm not mistake, mistaken, it's and again, you could have the accent on the end. I'm trying to think, I'm, I'm trying to remember like some Wilcoxon-esque uh, solos because he's got a lot of those kinds of things in there. Uh, would the accent be necessarily on the and? You know, because you go one and e a two and three and four and e a one and two e a and three and e a four. I guess it could be down. It could also be an upstroke accent on the and. We'd have to just kind of texturalize that. Like, what's what's the presentation of that? And then the triple Radom Q would be. Okay, so that's the rhythmic element of it. Let's get into like the little texture of the, the drag. The drag is inside the hand, a little grab. So that's basically what you're doing uh, regarding the development of the push-pull technique. And it doesn't fix the problem right away, but that, that element of push and pull inside the hand is certainly there. So let me just point this out. Watch my thumb and index finger on my right and left hand. You will see no pinching or closing down. What's the point? I'm getting that all in the back of the hand. In fact, there's a there's a, um, a phrase that I've gotten from like looking through the Nard book or through the Benjamin Dembski book, and it's a drag in front of 16th notes. And it took me a moment to sort of process it, but that's basically the same arrangement note-wise in terms of note numbers as it is the Radomir cue. So to make that seamless, nice drag 16th note come together, it's and so inside there you have all that Radomir QS move, or you could also refer to it as the second inversion of the paradiddle. I always label the paradiddles the regular paradiddle the inverted paradiddle, the reverse paradiddle, and then the second inversion. And those I would just qualify as numerically in stick control on page five, number five, six, seven, and eight. And so that last one be one E and a uh, two E and a uh, three. So in between my up to down is where I, I would insert the drag. Up, down, up, down, up, down. And inside there, there's a little drag. But to get those drags to really work, there's a few um, hand setups that I would really promote to build up the, you know, the shape and the shell of the hand. I always say you could take that hand and kind of reshape it like clay. You just have to like, you know, put the nice warm water on it, kind of smooth it out, keep shaping it up, 
do calisthenics that will reinforce the reflexes that you're after because you don't want to lose out on that um, consistency, the, the, the like moving yourself from one reflex to a new reflex. You know, oftentimes that older reflex is going to try to rear its ugly head and get in the way. And so a lot of things are done on the practice pad to rehabilitate or rebuild up and, and, and bring you another place to another place. So you can really uh, get the essence of those moves to show up. And it doesn't take a long time. It just takes consistent practice. I mean, there's guys out there that study with me that will verify or cooperate what I'm talking about. So um, let's see what VR says. In a master class, you demonstrated a three-step stroke for the jazz ride simple pattern, sort of an up tap down. Uh, yeah, so for the for the up tempo jazz ride simple pattern, or well, let's just say for the jazz ride simple pattern, let's basically take the slower version. I would do it in French grip. And that would allow me one building of relationship with the weight of the stick uh, to the, you know, the swing of the stick. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to hold on to it. I don't want to cradle and get in the way of the fluidity and the motion of the stick. That's one of the things I'm, I'm promoting that you can get a nice fluidity, but you have to learn to let go. And that's counterintuitive for drummers. But so with the ride symbol pattern, I have three directives that I would put forward to describe what I'm doing. And I always say, instead of trying to pull up on one at first, just lift up and deliver that first stroke on the down. We'll say that's beat four. So I do it this way. A one, two, three. Pop, drop up, pop, drop up, pop, drop up, pop, drop up, pop, drop up. See how my fingers stay with the body of the stick as I pop? That stick pivots over my index finger. That just shows that I have a good sense of balance with the stick, good placement. And, you know, if I did go back below the balance point, it would be a little more lumpy. You can hear the difference in tone. I certainly don't feel a good vibration sensibility inside the stick, which is one thing that you want to harmonize with, the resonant quality of the stick and how you house it. And so this would be the inroad to developing the relationship with that swing pattern, the balance, the, the consistency of motion, so that you have basically, I just described this as, you know, the pendulum swing and get inside and get the consistent pop, the same follow through. Notice the fanning of the stick. I don't want to exceed 90 degrees because then gravity's back here and I would have to thrust down. I want to follow with the weight of the stick. As I toss the stick up in the air, there's a value of weight. I want to harmonize with that. Work with it, not against it. And so those are the attributes that I, where I would start with the jazz ride simple pattern. For a really highly developed sense of independence, and I'm not just talking about hammering out a right hand thing against the left hand thing rhythmically. You know, you can kind of just pound that out. I'm, of course, I'm being a little facetious in my uh, expression here of what that is. But with this follow through and the independence of that orbit and movement, you can really build up a great sense of independence from a different standpoint of really owning that motion and not allowing the left hand's rhythmic activity disrupt that follow through. That builds up a different level of independence. And that's one of the things I'm looking for. And then, you know, you've got to bring it into the music sphere so that you can start to take what you have and um, fine tune it for your musical needs. You know, not everything is like a, a, a one fix all, you know, like this is an entrance, but there are dialect dialectical things that I would put into jazz that would not allow the stick to swing so open and maybe sit inside the hand a little bit more. But not allowing that to bust my relationship with this. This is my home base. And then all the other things are dialectical nuance to build around the styles of jazz or, or, or the dialect of jazz that you might find yourself like. So I hope that helps. Uh, Andreas, the push-pull. Is it a throwing feeling or is it more of a release, relax, and snap feeling? Hmm, that's a good question. I, I, I'll, let me just break it down. And as I go through, I'll kind of give my narrative as I go through. I don't like to sort of get in there and I can get a good quality of narrative. But so, push pull. The first thing that I'm thinking is that my delivery system, as I build up the fundamental, would be built from my forearm. And I'm just bringing that thick tip to the pad and pushing it open. 
Let's just qualify that there are essential three delivery systems. From your shoulder down, oh, look at that, that stick just pops. Okay, from my wrist, I'm gonna thrust forward, up, oh, that stick popped open, kicked my fingers open. And then we didn't talk about the forearm, that's the last frontier. Same thing, push that stick to the pad, you're gonna get that stick to kick the door open. So the impact is gonna give me, if I'm not in balance, I'm gonna fight against it. But if I'm in balance, it's gonna open up my fingers, there's a resistance. I don't wanna get like way over here all the time. That again would, would cause me to have to thrust back in. And then we would use that word snap. I don't wanna really work, um, overdrive the stick into the hand. I wanna kind of let it close into the hand. Hence, open close. Uh, push pull, you are pulling it in, but I don't want to overdrive. So if I do it slow, there's there's a little bit of a, a conceptual terminology or idea that I was coming up with. That, and I've had it resting in my head, but it sort of crystallized in one of my conversations this week. Is the stick has an opportunity to do a whole range of different kinds of movements. We are not only the puppet, but the puppeteer. So we want to harness that energy and give direction to it. In other words, if I do this, well, that produces a nice pivot. But that might not be appropriate for some of the things I want to do in manipulating the stick. So another way to harness that energy would be to give with the bounce of the stick and come up with a vertical response to the stick, allowing my forearm to give and support the bounce of the stick. Again, that's harnessing the energy and giving the proper direction. So in the push-pull, you'd want to have a certain resistance. You wouldn't want to go bop, 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 bop. That's like wild and out of control. You want to keep the stick in terms of whoops, a, um, a level of motion that sits more in a teetering uh, position. So like a seesaw. The glue and the bond of the fingers, absolutely imperative. How do you get there? There's a whole range of different things that I would do to help somebody achieve and really build up a relationship with that so that it doesn't falter. You know, you can get guys to do certain things, but then their fingers come unglued and they kind of lose traction with the stick. Not helpful. So in the essence of the pull, yeah, I could snap it in, but I don't know if this is gonna translate well over the microphone, but my concept, and maybe it'll work. Ride with me for a moment. If I just shut that stick into my hand, that kind of kills everything. It kills the tone. So I want to elasticize the tonality and the lift. So I don't know if you can hear that, but to me it sounds like I'm stretching the tone a little bit wider. And I'm not slamming that into my hand. The timing is now the stick falling, touching the pad, and my forearm lifting to produce the right impact of tip coming off the pad. So even when I'm here, that's still a consideration. And now it's just, you know, deeper into the hand now. Okay, so now I don't have the opportunity to lift at that tempo. There's no way I'm gonna be able to allow for that much space, time and space being relative. So I wanna just work within the confines of the slow motion move, really find myself into the spirit of the elasticity of what's going on, being considerate of the tonality, and then allow that as it goes faster to just tap into that natural momentum. Again, being the director of the energy. So I hope that answers. I know there's a lot of complexity to the setup of how the push pull works. Suffice it to say, I wouldn't release my wrist this much. That would be absolutely absurd. But if you do notice in your natural anatomy, if you let your wrist drop, your fingers will come to a more open position. And if you just whoop, pull that wrist back, look at those tendons, how they draw in. Now, do they completely close? No. But the energy of that kind of draw in is, again, another thing that we can harness and utilize to our advantage to manipulate the stick a little easier on the in inside of the hand. Remember, if you're also, if you're tense here and you're like squeezing here, you're basically closing down all the access to so if you're trying to, you know, with a tense thumb and index finger, a closure here, it's not going to work. And those guys who use their thumb certainly want to be very wary of that. And you can, you know, uh, really mess around with that tendon, that group of tendons right here and the hinge in your wrist by, at the base of your thumb. So when they're using that thumb, 
I, that agitates me. I'm just watching it and I feel like, oh man, this is more in harmony. And hey man, if I don't hit the kind of speed that you get from some of those like chop bus guys, like, um, I don't know. Well, the way Ramon does it, Ramon Montaigne, he's got a different thing. He kind of uses that Brazilian percussion. Uh, what's I, um, my, my brain is toast and I can't think of the proper name for the instrument, but he's got a very interesting approach to that. And, um, uh, you know, super high tech. It's it's like ridiculous. I've i like I think I was watching do like a will concert with with two sticks. All right. Um, do you have any advice for producing a clean, consistent cross stick? Uh, yes, I do. So I won't do it on the set here because I got to refigure my microphones. But well, I would hang on a second. Let me put on my different microphone here so that we don't uh, distort through this little talk back mic. And I've got my, Jeff, you'll have to tell me if everything's groovy when I do this. I'll do it. Okay. Oops. Well, my, my, my little pad here's moving on. Uh, not hearing that. I'm hearing something in a distance, Bruce, but I'm not hearing the, uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm hearing the kick or so. No, 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 no. So don't worry. We'll, we'll have to. I'll have to work on that that um, connection of my Scarlet, my interface unit with that. So anyway, here's here's the point. One of the things that you want to work on is keeping the heel of your palm on the snare drum. You know, I don't really, I don't separate. I mean, I do. That's not true. I do. I do because I, 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 I will lift it up a little bit sometimes, depending upon you know the activity of what's going on. Coming back to a tom to that, but in general terms, I'm going to kind of keep keep that heel of the palm on the snare drum, but I'm also going to use the tip of the stick as like a little motivation of a of a pivot or let's say there's a little hinge back there. I want to have my hand open. I don't want my fingers to be closed down like this. So I'm going to take my middle ring and pinky and, of course, kind of open them up and keep my hand cupped. And then the production of where you strike the stick to the hoop. I'm of that spot of like right about like, is that like about a quarter of the way into the stick or so? Maybe about a little bit more than a quarter. But you can experiment. If you come back to the two way, let's say more towards the middle of the stick, you're going to get a clubbier sound. If you come way back here on your way towards the edge, you're going to get sort of a little bit more of a, let's see if it goes through here on this microphone. And here. Ooh, that's much better. And then here. So there are elements of tonality that I would take into consideration. Like that reminds me of, of like a metal guy. Because they've got a bigger fat stick. And maybe they're not as fine-tuned in their delivery system or thoughtful about what they want to get in the cross stick. I'm not sure. I, I can't say. But I, that's a little more clubby. But it could be appropriate. And then, So nothing's off the table. Everything's on the table. You can, you can kind of mix and match and use your executive decision process and your musicianship to choose, like, what sound do you want to produce? You know? So anyway, I hope that... Gives you some a little direction for the cross stick. Hi, Tim. Tim's a student of mine. Any advice for playing two tap strokes consecutively in a groove? Yeah, okay. That's a touch value. So there's, you know, a little drop, a little open and close. If you're going. Let's say it's a basketed open close or, or a drop in catch. That's probably how I would frame it a little bit better. Those um, dynamic considerations take time. Um, most drummers play loud and louder. So to bring a variable, you know, of really bringing it down. Now you could talk to David Garibaldi and he's all about a certain level of that. I would still, I would concur with that, but I would also say, you know, you can drop into a note and still have a good touch. 
So the direction of the stick does not necessarily direct, um, give the essence of the dynamic. You know, you can get a, a fat upstroke, you can get a soft downstroke. So direction does not dictate dynamics. However, that being said, you're not going to do a lot of movement when you're getting an EN or an ANA if you're trying to keep those down in the mix. So if you were playing that, you'd want to go one, two, and a four, and a two, and a four, and a, and a, and a. So, you know, I'm just kind of letting it drop and catching it. In terms of like how you get tap strokes, that's one thing I would work on too. Play everything from the wrist, sit in the back of the hand. Uh, I call this a direct drive approach, kind of sitting back here, ring and pinky finger, helping to direct the stick to the pad. The stick will have some give and play. It will pull away from the hand, but as I make my turn back, I want to keep it in the hand. Building up that relationship of how you house a stick can be quite helpful in terms of what you want to do with those little inside the hand considerations for, for ghost notes, you know, and that's a challenging prospect. When I went through the Podemski book, this is an orchestra book with Freddie Gruber, and that's back, let's see, how many years now? <laughs> 1982, 81 or 82, that's uh, uh, 40 years, Jesus, Pat. okay. Uh, everything in the book, I could pull the book out and we would look and at several pages at the top, it would say, uh, stay on the tips, man. So there's a variable of staying to the tip. Oh, so I'm uh, sorry, I goofed that up. I want to get my back feet and maybe fall to my tip. So boom, now the EN would set me up with a lift to come into my two and four. One, e and two, a three, e and four, oh, e and two, a three, e and four. And I gotta be prepared that that e and doesn't sucker punch me into getting more out of the drum than I need. So those little considerations take a little time, but get some tap strokes together and work a little bit on that just to feel that you can play some note values. I always take stick control and I say, you know, play the first page or even just the first column or what I do generally is I start with the first four because it's more about the conceptual intake than the content. You don't need to overdose on content. If you're getting the concept, it's for me, it's concept over content. You can give somebody like 72 exercises and they still not, I might not get the concept. Maybe you let them dwell on three or four sticking arrangements and then they're like, oh, yeah, I got it, because they didn't get scattered. There's more of this like, oh, my God, I got to do 500 of these? No, no, no. You got to do a few of them and be very thoughtful of how you do that. Super inside what you're doing. Don't lose out on your concentration and what your goals are. Uh, explain the double, double stroke left-hand traditional grip. Okay. couple angles to get that at. And I say angles. couple different ways of producing a double. I would get a double from a slower double from a cradle position. I would let my thumb open up to let the stick bounce over the crook of the thumb. And then I would sandwich it between my index and my ring finger. And my pinky finger is always sort of a team member with the ring finger. So for slow doubles, for good control, that's where I'd want to sit. It would be sort of a little bit out of range to have to close, but I could. I could bring that index finger into what I would describe as an open close, you know, so getting that to and drawing that index finger into the base of my thumb. So I get more nimbleness, I get a little bit of stretch, and then there's variables of, you know, where that thumb and index finger can interact. If I'm playing some bounces, Maybe my thumb and index finger are right about here. But if I play that bounce a little faster, I may hover over it a little bit more to keep it in check. If I'm really opening it up, I might just let the thumb be the only guy kind of following the bouncing stick. But so that being said, that thumb to cradle is what I call it. Thumb, cradle, thumb, cradle. Nice and easy. It really produces a nice control and dominance. 
and direction to the stick. As I go faster, it would start to slowly morph into the index finger. And as I open it up, I would let it go back to the thumb cradle. Now, mind you, I'm not a traditional grip player. I have a lot of insights and a lot of great breakdowns, and I've helped many students massively improve their traditional grip. But there might be a nuance or two that I'm not as in touch with because I'm not playing it. I mean, I have a good imagination of where you can go with it. I have one of my great students, Steve Hatfield, who's a adjunct professor in Wichita at the uh, Wichita State University. Really great traditional grip. And we worked together on that a few years ago. We still, once in a while, we tap back into a couple things to keep it nibble. But boy, I watch him play and it looks beautiful. And he'll go and play it on kids. I don't. I made a decision back in 1978 that I was a match grip guy. Later on, I revisited it and I worked on my traditional grip based on all my knowledge of what I do in the match grip. And my, let's say my, my savantish recall of what I did with Freddie Gruber, because I did spend about six months in the building block process of that. And then watching many students and just having a good eye and imagination and, and several conversations with Freddie, not as a student, but as a, let's say, a confidant hang, um, all those different uh, arrangements of relationship we had after I was a student. So I hope that helps you out with the double strokes. Tap strokes, what decides if you play them with your hand closed or more open fashion? You mean with traditional grip? I would probably sit more in that for tap strokes in that more cradle position. Now, if I was playing faster, probably not. So if I was just tapping here, I would sit a little bit more with that index finger drawn down, my ring finger sitting under the body of the stick for support, because I don't the cradle wouldn't really work as well. It feels a little clumsy. It wants to go another place. And so with my index finger drawn in and my ring finger on the other side gives me a little bit more nuance when I'm playing a little faster. But slower, for good body and good control, I would sit more in an open hand position, or as I call it, the cradle position. So that really you have a duality of what I say, housing. You have this the clamp, the crook of the thumb, and then secondarily stabilized by the ring and the index finger. And of course, it, like I said, the pinky finger being a support value to the ring finger. That really draws into a great sense of stability. So you have now a nice solid sensibility and, and stability to the stick. And, you know, take it where you will. Take it where you will. Whoa, for the match grip. Oh, thank you for clarifying, Andreas. For the match grip, I would always sit mostly in a closed hand position for tap strokes, even when I'm playing down here faster. You want to get a sense of that intention inside the stick tip, that whatever impact you have, you mean it. Okay, now when you get softer, the intention has to be very close and be able to stand behind that with that good sense of touch. That takes time. That takes time to really build up that essence of that. Uh, playing a lot of light gigs, like gigs where you are in a situation where you have a little more command over the dynamic or you're forced into it, as I was in some situations. It was very aggravating, but I learned a great deal. You know, when you have a leader going like, you're playing too loud, you can't snap back and go, hey man, that's my vibe. That doesn't cut it. That will certainly get you fired or at least not called back for that gig. So in those settings, I looked at it as the ultimate challenge. Can I meet the challenge? And uh, that was the quest. And do I have the intention? And I was very fortunate to work with some people who noticed that. And they said, man, how do you play so light and keep it driving and keep the intensity up? And I say, thank you very much first. And second of all, because I was forced to do it, like these leaders that I worked with kind of, you know, pushed you into that zone. And like I said, you can either 
run away and hide from that developmental edge of your musicianship, or you can act with this. I take I take that other road. I'm all when I see the challenge, I'm like, okay, what do I need to do? So I hope that answers for your question, Andres. Gil. What wait a minute, Gil. I thought you were flying in a helicopter. What are you doing here? All right, so I played traditional grip almost all my life. After some time off, I'm having trouble with it. Would you suggest our infants with the match grip? You know. I would, I would still honor your roots with traditional grip. There would be things that I would do to readdress those uncomfortabilities that you might have, have in that you know, grip. Um, there are certain things that you'd want to do, again, experience-wise for you know, knowing how to get the hoop out of the drum and not injure yourself. Because when you do that with a traditional grip, chances are you close down. And you hit the rim shot, you don't get a perfect shot out of it. The vibration will just go right into the index finger or the, the bone of the thumb. And, you know, like a, one of those one of those carnival things where you hit the thing and the, the little ball goes up and rings the bell. That'll ring your bell. So, but in terms of the total developmental edge and agility to the hand... I would be one to always investigate. So, like, I don't play traditional grip, but I certainly mess around with thoughts and processes because I'm immersed in it with many of my students. Well, I don't say many, but, you know, maybe about 25%. And it kind of keeps me, you know, in touch with some of those greater sensibilities that I can push forward. But I think that the totality of developing your hand in that um, – in both positions or, you know, and then you've got, you, know, you say match grip, you've got French grip, you've got German, then you've got American. All those would present, I think, a more nimble left hand at the end of the day. Uh, and you got to watch how you're moving. You know, you got to be sensitive to, are you releasing? Are you falling with the drum? You know, I mean, falling with the stick into the drum and not jamming it down there and throwing it in there. Uh, how much tension do you have? how can you gauge the tension to the release and still have the stick sit comfortably in your hand? You know, all those little nuances. Those are, that's what I do every day, man. I mean, all that little pressure point thing. This is 40 years of teaching now. This is not, you know, making stuff up by the seat of my pants or entering into, uh, hey, yeah, just do that. It's cool, man. I got a whole program. I got a dedicated system, systematic building block process to help unite and also to bring your uh, observation skills and the feeling because we intellectualize it at first so we can have a conversation but we need to bring it here so you just go oh yeah that's exactly how it should be natural as Freddie Blue would say natural <laughs> Freddie what a piece of work all right uh, another question Jeffrey I think we're caught up at the moment. I'm sure we'll get another one in here in a minute. If you guys have any questions, please drop them in. It doesn't matter what it is. There's no, it could be a beginner question or advanced question. Yeah, exactly. No, uh, no, no, um, no rules and no, no like, rules. and I'm not sure if I should answer that or ask that. Uh, you can ask what Bruce's favorite sticks are, maybe symbols, uh, his approach to playing. You know, there's nothing off balance. I mean, off, off yeah. the grid. What are my favorite sticks? I'll tell you what my favorite sticks are. This was a great find. My student, David Bronson, who's a great drummer, played with uh, for many years. Didn't play with him anymore, but played with the Righteous Brothers for, I don't know, 20 something years. Uh, when Vic Perth came out with the Double Glaze 5A, I didn't know about them. And he had been, I don't know, was it NAMM show or maybe, I don't know. But anyway, he came for a lesson. This is when I was in li our live lessons. I haven't really done that for the last year and some months. And he said, hey, man, have you ever tried these? And I went, Wow, these feel great. And as I've gotten older and the skin gets drier, this double glaze uh, lack of finish really gets the stick to sit nice in my hand. So there's never really a day where I feel any slippage or the tackiness that I want to feel between my hand and my stick. And that's very important. You want good placement and you want those fingers to stay in traction with the sticks. You don't want to you know, get your fingers to kind of feel slippery and come off, or especially traditional grip. A lot of guys struggle with that placement in the crook of the thumb. Not that this is the cure-all, but it certainly was a good advantage to feeling uh, 
better tackiness inside the hand and this like nice placement. I'll put it that way. Good placement. Uh, a couple things. Uh, yes. We'll clean up things. First of all, yes, you turned me out of those sticks uh, during our lessons, and I have to say, I I vote ten thumbs up. <laughs> I think I really like them too. Yeah. Um, also, there was a comment here about hearing an echo. Um, there seems to be a thing going on today. It might be with Streamyard. It might be something to do with an interface. We're not exactly sure. Yeah. But we'll work on that. I apologize for that. There is definitely an echo. Try to refresh first. Um, but I think. I think it's on on the end here or on StreamYard. So apologize yeah, I tried, for that. Right. We yeah. tried two different things here on my end. What I did was I tried headphones and I tried just regular speakers and both presented the same issue. Yeah. Sometimes it can be equipment and sometimes, it, honestly, it can be a, a StreamYard, which is a great service, but at times it will do that. So apologize for that. We'll push through it. But um, there is a question here I want to throw up here. Sure. Here we go. Let's see here. Um, where'd it go? Apologize. There we go. Uh, explain, please, the technique for a fast tempo swing. Okay. Um, there's a nuance that we want to relate to that would be a hybrid of French grip and German-esque receiving of the stick. A little bit of that understanding of molar is in there. I would say not a little bit, the whole molar element, and then the push-pull technique. So if I'm throwing down and I throw here, I'm just going to let that stick bounce, and I'm going to let my forearm just kind of drop, and I'm going to let that stick just come right back into my hand. Now, the visual, I see that. And then many people say, man, it looks like you're rotating your forearm. I'm not. I'm letting it go. It's, there's no rotation. There's no um, winding or grinding, so to speak. So it's all built on understanding the throw and just letting the stick come back to inside my hand. I want to keep my fingers on the body of the stick because as you play faster, you got to keep that grab, that that element of push pull. You've got a good, you know, resource with the symbol because the symbol is very giving, much like a practice pad. But and that just takes a little time to kind of process. So the molar element is in there. Here's three note molar. There's an element of strength and resilience and uh, support with the ring and the pinky finger, making sure that they're on the other side. Again, that pulling element of bringing the stick into the hand, because you know the stick hits the pad, stretches your fingers open, and you have to draw it back into the hand. So that's really you know where I would go with that to build that up. But I would start slow, so that the mechanical element of pop, roll, pop and roll is available so i wouldn't necessarily do this at this tempo but as a building block to kind of get myself into the track of where that's going to go when you start to push it tempo wise that's where i would start and uh you know a lot of playing is going to be helpful like years ago maybe about six seven years ago i was really working on like trying to hit like 350 to 400 and I was making it. It was it was challenging, but that's a skill set that you have to really sit with regularly. I think on a on a just an average day of waking up, I can probably hit three hundred pretty good with that because I'm letting go. I'm letting that stick down. So mastering the control of that just takes time. Could you show the four stroke molar? Okay, four stroke molar. So I want to get four notes. Let me go sideways here so we can just see the locomotive action of the stick. Watch how I – so there's a locomotive action. There's a few little uh, delicacies that I would speak about in developing that. I want to have you know the ability to kick the door open and really let the stick go. Watch the button of my stick as it rises. You know, the button of the stick is walking up 
to towards the back of my hand and then I'm getting ready to re-fire, so to speak. But I can get it to be nice and bouncy. Now that's a pretty good bounce and you see my fingers are still attached. You know, once in a while the stick will get away from me, but in general not. But I can also keep it inside the hand. Still letting it go. So one of the building blocks I would use is, you know, just what I call walk the stick up. Being mindful of where you're impact stick, uh, impacting the stick tip to the surface. If you're getting ahead of yourself and you're going, not happening. If you have too much release with your wrist, not happening. So you got to temper that. You've got to watch how your locomotive action is working. The system on the inside of the hand has to be well constructed. You can get anybody, no, I didn't say anybody, but you can get a lot of people to sort of get a, a delivery system, but with a reckless uh, housing inside the hand, you know, it'll be, and that's, that's not anything that's usable. I want things that are usable. I want, so inside that eight stroke roll, There's all that lift and drop and locomotive action from molar or an a-paradiddle diddle. Again, I'll call your attention to my thumb and index finger position. Look how nice and relaxed and open they are. And look at that calibration of fingers responding to the stick inside the hand on the left hand. Look at the support of the ring and pinky finger on the right hand. I would take the middle finger off. I don't even need it. So that molar thing, there's definitely a constructed path. It's not just, I can't, I could throw all those things out, but if you didn't walk the steps that precede what I would speak about at this moment in time, you'll miss out on a greater picture of development on the inside of the hand. And I, I, I know that sounds, you know, kind of flaky, but you could talk to all my students about that and see how that brings your inner understanding of your hand to this place of going, oh yeah, that's easy. And as it gets faster, maybe I draw it into an American position and I use my fingers just a little bit more to help propel the stick along with my forearm to give me the locomotive action that I need. Uh, I hope that answers your question. It's a good one. Burger King of Doom. That's a great, what a great moniker. Could you explain how to execute rim shots with the traditional? Yes. What I would do, I would stay in a cradle position. I would stay with my stick here. You are less prone to getting that vibration into the bone here or into the index finger bone. If you do it with a closed hand and kind of bring the stick into a closed position, like you might do for other things, but not with a rim shot, like this, dropping. I'm opening up, bing, I'm dropping right in and closing. Absolutely a necessity to understand. But for the rim shot, I'd sit in that cradle position. And then you just got to work on the consistency of getting that to pop every time. Oops. As you can see, I got about two out of three or three out of four there. I'm not, you know, well, I got to play it on the drum too. But I, I'm just with our echo effect and with not my uh, inaccessibility to my um, overhead microphone and my interface unit, I just want to stay chill. Otherwise, it might distort if I hit the drum and that won't be good. So, but I hope that colors your imagination for what you can do. Remember, your delivery system is ultimately so important. If you don't have that, you're, you know, you're really going to uh, lose out on the greater uh, essence of how you get that back. When you play doubles, do you always use the open close technique, or do you do some sometimes, or do you sometimes play them with? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, you know, wrists absolutely. Um, 
but when the wrists are in motion, there's still a, what I would call a bounce and a catch to the stroke of the stick. If I play them here stiffly, that's not helpful. Oh, however, you know, I might be inside the hand, but there's still always a little bit of a, a response to the stick in the inside of the hand to open and give back a little bit. So for slower doubles, I would start to build them from what I call the, the bounce catch, bounce and catch. What, watch when I make my turn, the stick is still in my hand. I have a second version, would be bounce turn. So I take the catch and the turn and I consolidate them and I still bring the stick in the hand. If I was playing doubles from here, So on my launching down, the stick starts to pull away a little bit. Uh, I impact, it gives me a little bit more to open the fingers, and then I kind of draw it back into the hand without doing any excessive snap or pull. When I'm down here, still driven from the wrist, and it's, yes, all in that open and close vein. So I have, you know, a series of exercises, little calisthenics that I would work on. Uh, some things would be very choreographed. Well, not some things, all things. But for short range rolls, for example, if I'm doing seven strokes, I would do um, the stick control exercise on page 30, number 11. That's a triplet blade based seven stroke roll. That move, if I take away the doubles for a moment, let's just address the actual move. It will be down, tap, 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 up, tap, down, tap, 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 up, tap, down, tap, 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 up, tap, down. Three, eight times, time signatures are so many. One and two and three and lead one and two and three and lead one and two and three and lead one. Roll. Still see the tap, I mean the up tap down in there. Uh, so, but it's moving faster. But it's all driven to have this accessibility of that open to close or push to pull or bounce to catch, however you want to describe it. On my side, working for me, not working against me. So, but I would generate a lot of my doubles in a wristed mode so that I don't just push from the forearms. You can use the forearms as an emotional additional delivery system. Or, you know, depending upon what you do, again, nothing's off the table. It all comes down to, like, what's the attitude of the music and the dialect that you're trying to produce? And, you know, where are you going with it? So um, I have numbness in my left hand fingers. I'm in difficulty moving the stick and maintaining the fulcrum. Yes. Um, that, you know, I, had, I, I think you, Michael, I think you're the guy who asked, uh, asked me the question on email. I sort of addressed that at the beginning, and I was just saying, you know, with those issues, there's many prospects that I would go through to readdress those things. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a miracle worker. Or, you know, I don't, I know how to sort of build things in terms of technique, and I know it works, but I'm not going to go be a snake oil salesman and go, yeah, it's all, it's all good. But it is, in general, you got to bring some nimbleness to those hands and fingers and see what we can do to regenerate nerve endings and positionings and pressure points inside the hand to lift it up. I, I have no idea what is truly going on until I get involved. Like I've had, three, I said at the beginning, I had three students that I can name. I won't, but I can name them who had focal dystonia. Uh, this is like a neurological condition where you kind of disconnect from your hand and it just does what it wants to do and you lose the essence i guess it's is it from per, um, the uh, perpetual motion or the repetitive motion is there another element to it i don't know i'm not a doctor but you know there are supplemental things that you can do like supplements i was saying you know like turmeric's good for inflammation and that stuff I don't know what other supplements, and I do a little reading on that. My wife is actually a nurse, so, you know, she'll talk about it. But, you know, a lot of the science is sort of like on that stuff. They don't do, like, intensive studies. So, But I, I do believe in dietary considerations and supplements and outside of drumming, other things, whether it's 
practicing yoga, which is what I do for many years, or whether you practice some kind of a martial arts or Tai Chi or Qigong. I have a, an old friend who's, who's formerly a chiropractor, but now he works more in the Chinese uh, medicine industry, and he's doing Qigong, and he's really well-versed in that. He's got a lot of great concepts and things that he's been learning over the last several years, and there's a lot of benefits to that. And I got to say, I, I think his parents have good genes, but he has passed a lot that to, that to his parents. And he's got both mom and dad are like 97. And I watched his dad like working out at 97. And I showed it to my, uh, my our nanny. We have a lady that lives with us for our kids. And she looked at it and she goes, how old is he? Like 70? I said, no, this guy's 97. And she was, you know, completely taken back. So there is an element of good genes. But being balanced, being sensible, dietary considerations, working out. I'm a big proponent. I don't have it here, but there's a thing called the Dynaflex. It's a gyro ball. Really great for strengthening your hand and opening channels up. And it's not just for the wrist and the forearm. You can actually be spinning that, use it for your shoulder. And I've used that. I've had one since 1978. And um, I don't use it all the time, but if I feel anything that's a little bit disruptive, I'll sit with that a little bit. And of course, getting on the mat and doing yoga, like, you know, these days, because I have two small kids and a dog, I would say, honestly, I'm on the mat about four times a week. I used to be six times a week easily, but uh, those scheduling issues kind of have to be around the kids and the dog and all that stuff. So anyway, Michael, I hope that kind of gives you a little bit of sensibility. If you're really looking to uh, see if we can do anything. You can always contact me and see if I'm the guy for you to bring about a regenerative uh, response to what you're looking for in your hand, you know? What else, Sir Jeffrey? I'm just met. How do you get fluid with traditional grip, turning the hand from normal traditional to having palm down and using the, oh, man, that's, <clears throat> I mean, not easy, but it's a prospect. Uh, you know, just going one, two, three, four, and lean one, two, three, four, and lean one, two, three, four, and lean one, two, three, and lean four, and lean one, two, three, and lean four, and lean one. You got to build that bridge. I mean, I don't do this. This is not my game, but, you know, looks pretty good. I'm, 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 I'll, I'll give myself a good solid B, B for Becker. Uh, you know, you got to get that stick rooted in the crook of the thumb, get the index finger to and middle finger to work as a team. Yes, you have wrist involved there too. You've got to walk that stick around to get it to what I call the loop position and let that bounce, let the forearm be activated to respond to that. Come back in. I would sort of thumb it as I come back down. So let that index finger get out of the way so that it's set up to sit on top of the stick. The practicality of using that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to say. I mean, in the jazz setting, yes, because you know you can alter positions for comping, but for backbeat, I wouldn't do like a wild palm down all the way to whipping here. That's excessive movement for molar. Molar would sit more here, and I would have an element of wrist coming in and coming back but not a huge amount of wrist throw at that point, especially when you're playing that fast. But, you know, if you get that wind like that with a super wind, that's excessive. It just doesn't feel like it would be a natural thing to really develop. I know I've seen some, you know, guys run that by and it's like, you know, not quite sure. Anyway, I see that we've hit the, uh, the hour mark here. Oh, Thank you, Cassie. Cassie Lobo, uh, Groove Bug. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, and thank you for participating, you guys. Tim, thank you, man. Go packs, go. <laughs> go packs, right on. Um, uh, Jeffrey, any last minute thoughts? No, I, it was great to see everybody and get. The, there were some great questions. Um, I love this because as a as a student, I learn something every time just watching, which kind of gets me in trouble on the transitions here, so I apologize. But, uh, yeah, it was great. I thought it was a, a great hour. I appreciate everybody showing up and um, participating. Great time. 
And uh, if, if anybody out there is serious, you can always contact me. I'm sure I can find a, a spot to accommodate and things are busy, but things are always in fluctuation. So you can always head over to my website, uh, be on the lookout for a masterclass to be announced shortly. We're going to put one up, but we're just picking the date right now. We haven't really gotten the date locked in. But I've done, I don't know, four or five of these online master classes, and they've gone extremely well. They're really a blast. Uh, we get a consolidated conversation of kind of one topic or trying to stay in the lanes of one topic. So keep an eye out for that. If you like the YouTube channel, I'm not Mr. Like put up content every day or every second day or every, every week. But please push subscribe and like and uh Follow me on Instagram and all that good stuff. I'm not Mr. Social Media, like I said, but I always like to know that there's a group of people out there that I can engage with. And uh, when I do a masterclass, I want to be close to the vest with you guys so that you guys know what's going on in our world. And for some of you that came in late, um, we always post these up pretty much right after uh, we are finished. So we have a live playlist on Bruce's uh, YouTube channel. Um, so if you like these, please subscribe, of course, and like. But more importantly, if you want to go back and look through these lives, feel free to go back and, and play around. So. And all my lessons, too. There's some good stuff up there. I'm Absolutely. very, I'm always uh, proud of, of some of the work that I've put up there. I've seen things. I know that the production value is not the, always the highest tech, but I'm trying to get my message through. So I hope it's my message about content, Bruce. Yes. I hope my message is, is better than some. I've worked on the, you know, the presentation of lighting and getting better on that. And Jeff's kind of, Push me along with that as well. Yeah, so you know, we're using a, a prod, but we're getting you there. And That's right. and, and a uh, shout out to, to George, drummer I, photographer. I was going to tell Rose. you that. Does he sell those shirts? Because I desperately want one. He does. He I, he yeah. sent this to me because you know we worked together for the. Um, uh, he did the the, the shoot the for me at uh, Pasic. Yeah, yeah. yeah did I did a master yeah. class. Yeah. So I shout out to, to George. Absolutely, shout George out to George Burroughs. Burroughs. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to head over there and get that shirt because I just dig that shirt and yeah. I love to wear that on stream and. And he does great photography work as well. So yes, he does. Yes, he does. All right. Well, thank you, Bruce, for um, well everything and having. Thank you, Jeffrey. All right. And uh, we'll see you guys again. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to push you out, but we'll right. we'll see you guys again, and uh, we'll announce the next Q and A and go from there. That's okay. right, man. All right. We'll talk to you guys later. Cheers. Have a great weekend, guys. Bye bye.